Over the last year or two, I've made a number of life-changing decisions. One of those was relocating to another part of the country after being offered a position at a company in the state where I wanted to live. My supervisor, Lucas, had known me for a long time. I work in an industry where most people know each other and the main players, and they offered me a job based on my criteria and many other factors. I was well qualified for the position he hired me for. So I relocate across the nation and start working. This company has a main office and a supply warehouse. I worked in the supply warehouse. There is no manufacturing done here. Only supporting pieces are needed for the main office. Within a month, the company's owner, Jacob, shows up at the office seeking my supervisor. The main company is approximately eight or nine hours away. So this was a long trip. The owner never came down to the warehouse, not since it first opened seven years ago. My supervisor is not there. He typically isn't, and he doesn't need to be, because I can manage it. Plus, he lives up the road in case I need him. Jacob instantly starts yelling at me. He never speaks to me. He rants at me the entire time he speaks with me, berating me about the fact that I need to take inventory since the fiscal year is coming to an end and that I need to maintain the warehouse, had I ever done this before. He gave me the third degree and treated me like an idiot. Meanwhile, I texted Lucas, and he showed up, and Jacob changed his mind entirely. At that point, he did not say anything to me. I did not even make eye contact. Jacob left after they chatted. I felt the encounter was strange, and it had been a long time since I was asked if I could handle a warehouse. I used to operate a 100,000 square foot warehouse. It was basically the size of a large garage. Over the next month, Jacob would call and rant at me about various topics. Overall, everything was going well. One day, I texted Lucas and told him I was heading home for around 30 minutes to handle some paperwork for my apartment. Then Jacob calls me. He informs me that when he contacted the warehouse phone, someone answered and indicated I wasn't present. This cannot be true because only Lucas and I worked at the warehouse. He tells me I can't leave the warehouse until I receive his permission, because what if crucial calls arrive and no one can reach me? The phone has a connection for emergencies and will forward to my cell phone, so the point was moot. So I finish what I'm doing in the apartment and return to the office. Lucas arrives at the office and informs me that he intends to leave in a few months and will give me the warehouse because he is unable to do so due to mental health issues. During this conversation, I told Lucas how Jacob spoke to me and I was starting to dislike it because I was weary of being treated disrespectfully. We had a long conversation and I was unsure, but everything sounded like great prospects for me to progress. A few weeks later, Jacob calls and starts ranting at me. Then he asks how long I'd been at the office that day. I told him I had been there since 8.30 am, the start time. He stated I was fired a week and a half ago, and Lucas should have informed me. I gathered my belongings and left the office. After contacting Lucas and not being able to reach him, I went next door and told the neighboring warehouse workers what had happened and asked if they knew anyone searching for work. They claimed I could work part-time because it was crop season. I could do some work there for a while. The next day, Lucas is at the office and has invited me to come over. I did, and he stated that Jacob was in the wrong and that I could easily sue Jacob if I did not receive my payment by the end of the day. The law here requires that you receive your final salary within 24 hours of termination. Lucas informed Jacob that what he did was wrong and that I could sue him if I wanted to. Jacob informed Lucas that he didn't want that woman to be an issue and that he would pay me whatever I wanted in cash with no paperwork and to be quiet. Don't talk about money. He acknowledged that he didn't want me there and didn't trust me to lead the company because I was a woman. That's why he never showed me respect. That's why he questioned my ability to manage the facility. I'm a woman. Lucas was furious after hearing this. 
and he has since left the company or is negotiating his severance package. We don't talk about it much anymore. A few weeks later, I called my father and explained what had happened. My father is one of the important players in the industry that I described. I've been in this field for about a decade, having previously worked for my family's firm. My father was furious and threatened to drive that company so deep into the ground that they would be unable to recover. It has been three months now. The corporation is on the verge of declaring bankruptcy or ceasing operations. Jacob thought he was losing money previously, but now that one day shipping from the main office is international, they can no longer support the products as well as they could when I was running a warehouse. Furthermore, my father went in and provided free replacement units to all of Jacob's customers. He will support and care for the parts, which cost several thousand dollars per unit from the firm. So now, not only does my father's company have a larger consumer base, but he has entirely eliminated all of Jacob's items and annihilated their customer base. This does not mention the fact that my father's company was previously a major supplier to Jacob's company. I was an observer during the event, but to say I didn't have a great time would be a lie. Company A installed fencing, walls, and barriers. Daniel ran Company A. Daniel was a wonderful, upstanding guy who took over his father's firm and helped it grow into something large. Daniel had an employee named Aiden. Aiden had been with Company A for several years, yet Daniel and Aiden always rubbed off on each other in negative ways. Daniel always thought Aiden was the king of shortcuts and sloppy workmanship. When Daniel took over the company from his father, he put greater pressure on Aiden to improve the quality of his job or be let go. Aiden eventually got tired of the extra strain and quit, forming his own fencing firm, Firm B. Here's where I come in. I started working for a company that provides business services to small and medium-sized businesses in the area, and both Company A and Company B became my clients. This occurred some years after Company B's formation. From the outside, Company A appeared to be the local company that has been around forever and produces high-quality work that you can rely on. But they are not going they never strive to be cheap, but you can rely on them. Company B was a fledgling company that was lowering costs and competing in every manner imaginable, often by lying or deceiving its customers. That's when Company C steps in. Company C was constructing a production plant in the region and requested a wall with gates to surround it. This was going to be a large contract, and the only two players in the area who could conceivably execute it were Company A and Company B. This was a very valuable contract. If my memory serves me well, the salary was somewhere around seven figures. Company A and B went to bid. Company B came in at about a 30% cheaper pricing point, and despite Daniel's best efforts, Company B was unable to complete the task at the price point specified. Of course, money talks ensued, and Company B secured the deal. I recall Daniel being enraged, in his opinion, what Aiden was doing was wrong. He didn't mind fair competition, but Aiden's had always been significantly underbid, overpromised, and relied on cost overruns to generate a profit. Daniel's business philosophy was that a price is a price, and if he says he'll do X for Y, even if it means losing money, that's how he was raised. After some time, Daniel receives a phone call from Company C. They presumably fired Aiden and his company since they were unable to complete the assignment and ask Daniel if he can come in and correct the mistakes. Daniel accepts and finishes the work. At this time, Daniel begins to think. He has to get Aiden out. Aiden is taking too much money from his pocket. Daniel comes up with the concept of buying Aiden out. But Daniel knows that if he approaches Aiden, no matter how much he offers to pay, Aiden will say no. So Daniel has to be intelligent. Daniel was discussing this with me during one of our meetings. We had grown fairly close, and I tell Daniel that I bet there are lawyers out there who specialize in assisting other corporations in acquiring other businesses. Daniel asks whether I know about any. I don't, 
Although I did have a client who specialized in commercial law and would be more experienced with this situation, I give Daniel's contact information and he thanks me. Daniel contacts the lawyer and explains his intentions. The lawyer informs Daniel that a lawyer who had worked for him now works for a mergers and acquisitions firm. And if Daniel wanted to buy Aiden's company, he's convinced that this group could do it. Furthermore, because this firm was located in a large metropolis far from this small hamlet, Aiden was unlikely to be aware of what was going on. Daniel calls the firm and expresses his desire to buy out his competition and hire their services. This is already getting a little long, so let me get to the point. This firm eventually purchased Aiden's company, Lock, Stock, and Barrel, and gave it to Daniel. Aiden was fully unaware that his arch nemesis had recently acquired his own company. I recall Daniel telling me about the day he entered Aiden's company with such excitement. Daniel was told he owned the firm, Aiden had been paid, and he was looking forward to meeting the new owner on Monday morning. Aiden was granted the position of general manager and is now considered second in command. With his paperwork and the attorney who helped him acquire the business, which I now own, Daniel entered the building that had once belonged to Aiden. I am Aiden. That's ridiculous. Hi, Daniel. Here are the docs. A lawyer Aiden knew confirmed that everything was true. I am Aiden. So you are now my boss. Hi, Daniel. Yes. Now, get up. That is my chair. I'm fatigued and need to sit down for a minute. I am Aiden. This is my office. Hi, Daniel. This is my firm. And I've decided that this office is now mine. Therefore, you'll need to move out of my chair. Aiden climbs out of the chair. Hi, Daniel. Great. Have a seat, Aiden. I am Aiden. Thanks. Hi, Daniel. Aiden, I believe the first order of business today is to eliminate redundancies. I am Aiden. What do you mean? Hi, Daniel. You see, Aiden, when one company acquires another, there is overlap, redundancy, two HR departments, two secretaries, two accountants, and so on. However, everything has been consolidated into a single business. So you now have redundancies and overlaps, which are a waste of money. I am Aiden. Hi, Daniel. And I don't need two owners working for the same company. He chuckles and tells me that I had the largest devouring grin on his face. Aiden, it has become evident that your services are no longer required and you will be terminated immediately. Aiden complained. Daniel, the decision is final. You may take your personal stuff and exit the premises. What time did you arrive at work this morning? I am Aiden. 7 a.m.? Hi, Daniel. Okay, so you've been here for two hours. I'll make sure payroll pays you for two hours at the agreed-upon rate, per the buyout agreement, and have a great day. I am Aiden. So you just fired me. Just like that. Hi, Daniel. I should have done it a long time ago. I understand. Aiden, how about my family? Hi, Daniel. Aiden, I just bought your company and gave you a large sum of money. You will be all right. Now get out of my office and building. And thus is how Daniel acquired and fired an employee he should have fired years ago. Some background. I recall vividly the day Daniel set an appointment with me to review Company B services and negotiate a new service contract with us. It was the day Daniel fired Aiden. Daniel was in a fantastic mood, one of his best ever. We took care of the business at hand, and Daniel, you were quite helpful to me. Get this done. I'd like to invite you out for dinner and drinks, and we can watch Monday Night Football together. I actually hadn't. I told you, Daniel, that I didn't do much. He said, oh yes, you did. You pointed me in the right direction. I said, that's the least I could do. He said, well, I'd still like to take you out to dinner and drinks if that's okay with you. Now, I not want to turn down free beer and food, so I accepted. And that night, Daniel, and I went to a neighborhood bar to watch Monday night football while eating and drinking. As Daniel recounted, the entire experience was a joy. 
It was in the upper six figures, not retirement money, but enough to do whatever you want with your life. According to what I've heard, Aiden eventually moved away from that region and into another, and that was the last I heard of him. Then, Daniel renamed Aiden's business as a commercial-only operation while shifting the focus of his main business to residential. Daniel and his son are still in charge of both businesses today.